Good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to what is our final of the live streams with the 2020 RAOs Director Candidates. My name's Peter John. Um, I'm a long-term member of RAOs. I'm an instructor and an aircraft owner, and I'll be your host and moderator for this evening. I'd like to start the evening off by uh, reminding everybody that uh, if you've not already received it, you will soon receive your Sport Pilot magazine. And in the magazine is a ballot paper with a return envelope. Um, you're encouraged to uh, exercise uh, your democratic right as a member and uh, complete the ballot paper by selecting uh, your two preferred candidates. Um, mail the ballot paper back to RAOs by last mail on the 25th of September to ensure your votes counted. If you'd like to watch or re-watch uh, the prior live streams, uh, visit the RAO's Facebook page or YouTube page and um, enjoy them at your leisure. The address uh, will be on the screen shortly, uh, just to remind you how to, uh, to jump into that space. This evening, we expect to run for about an hour. Uh, and I would like to once again, uh, thank everybody um, for joining us. So tonight our focus is going to be uh, on a more philosophical level. Um, we have received uh, a number of questions over the last couple of weeks and have had some hangovers or some questions that have hung over from uh, the last live broadcast. We've captured the sentiment of the questions to maximise uh, the time available to the candidates tonight. We won't be taking questions live. Um, because we really do have a lot to get through. So I would like to uh, invite the candidates to, uh, to come on stream now. Welcome, Danny, Simon, uh, Michael, and uh, Andrew will be joining us uh, shortly. He has a, a prior work commitment uh, that has uh, kept him uh, um, behind for a, uh, for a short while. Um, <coughs> we'll introduce Andrew when he joins us. Evening, PJ. G'day, PJ. Thanks. Hi, PJ. Thank you. Okay, welcome. So we might just uh, launch straight into the questions. Um, the first one um, relates to RAOS's uh, involvement in the um, aviation sector. Some people believe that aviation is a one-size-fits-all. Uh, they also believe that there should be a uniform set of rules Put simply, there's no need for RAOs. Why then does RAOs exist? Somewhat of a rhetorical question, I think. Um, Simon, we might kick off you. What are your thoughts on why RAOs uh, does exist and should exist? Oh, thanks, PJ, and uh, a warm welcome to all our members that have joined us this evening, and thanks to you for moderating again. Um, appreciate your efforts in the background to uh, make this all happen and, and to all the other RAO staff. Uh, look, it, it's a very, like you say, a very philosophical question and an interesting one that's been posed. I guess in response, I would simply say that um, no need for RAOs. Well, if that were true, we'd all learn to fly on a Boeing 737. Um, there'd be no need for aerial firefighting aircraft or for Air Forces, SpaceX wouldn't be launching rockets, and a whole bunch of other aviation activity wouldn't be occurring. Quite simply and fundamentally, one size doesn't fit all. It just doesn't work. The aviation ecosystem has to consider the different environments, the purpose and the operation of, of all aviation activity. And to try and have aviation that fit in all of those environments, all of those purposes and was able to achieve all those operations would just physically not be possible. Um, and, and hence why we have, you know, a tiered aviation system, and that includes the training, it includes how we license pilots and maintenance personnel, right down to the aircraft class and weight categories that we operate in. And what it's, what's important to understand is that recreational aviation absolutely has a place and a purpose within that ecosystem. Um, if 
if we try and make aviation a one-size-fits-all uh, outfit, then what it will lead to is really a lack of innovation and or growth in aviation. And quite simply, there just won't be any freedom for people. But what we need to consider is uh, the different risks need to be treated differently. Um, RAOs has a lower risk than some av other aviation operations and, and hence we're approved as a, to self-administer. But, but overall, I think RAOs is, is clearly filling a gap. It's, uh, and that's demonstrated by the steady growth in membership that we're seeing. Um, RAOs clearly caters to the enthusiast and the, and the aviation purist. Um, I'd like to think, and you know, certainly a lot of people I've spoken to believe that um, RAOs makes flying easier, more affordable, and far more enjoyable. Um, RAOs really is about flying as a hobby. Um, and, and what we have is this unique and wonderful position as a self-administering body to be able to provide that niche recreational sport hobby that all our membership loves. Simon, thanks very much. Interesting perspective and some good thoughts there. Um, Danny, would you like to respond to the question, please? Sure, thanks PJ and welcome everyone. I wish I could see you all instead of just staring at myself answering these questions. Um, I've never, I, I really don't understand that kind of line of thinking, um, the one size fits all. And I would hazard a guess that most of our members also agree automatically. I took that question as a one size fits all, as in the current um, aviation system from RAOs type flying to commercial, um, fire and rescue, et cetera, as incorporating all of those sectors in a one size fits all. And there is obviously a lot of problem with that. And to simplistically put that, um, it's like me wanting to ride my bike on the road and um, having to go and get a map it doesn't fit. So I think common sense will tell you a one size fits all doesn't work. And, um, yeah, Ariel is here to ensure that it is not a one size fits all, even though I doubt that would be a thing. Okay, thank you very much, Danny. I see Andrew's joined us. Welcome, Andrew, and uh, welcome to the final of the sessions for the uh, 2020 candidates. Thank you very much, and my sincere apologies for being late, but uh, I'm in Western Australia working, and I work in shipping, and so uh, I never really know when the boats are going to go. But now, now, conveniently, I've got an hour and a half break, so this fits in perfectly. So apologies for my lateness. So I'll give Michael the opportunity to uh, to respond to the question and then I'll just uh, rehash the question for you so you can get on the same page. Michael, no thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, PJ. I, I, look at, um, I look at it from the same perspective as Simon and, and Danny have. Um, you know, I, I think you know, there's a reason that McDonald's and Hungry Jacks exist is to give people choice. Um, and even within a McDonald's, you've got a Big Mac, you've got a fillet of fish, and you've got chicken nuggets. Um, and I think it's important to, to realise that um, people do want that choice, and sometimes the choice is, um, you know, flying with CASA or not flying with CASA. Um, now, I mean, that's a deeper philosophical thing to to uh, debate whether CASA is serving a purpose or not, but I think the important thing here is that with RAOs existing, it offers choice. Um, but that, that, uh, that said, I, I think the... There, there is an underlying fact, and that fact is that one size doesn't fit all. Um, if you look in certain parts of, of aviation outside of the sports sector, we've got um, uh, charter operators. I was, I was talking to a charter operator uh, about a week or 10 days ago who's facing difficulty because they, they also offer joy flights and they've got to maintain their joy flight aircraft to the same standard as their charter uh, aircraft. Uh, and that's presenting them with significant difficulties. And it's just one example of many in, in uh, aviation where one size doesn't fit all. Um, and I think <clears throat> it it almost reflects a, um, a lack of understanding about what RAOs does and, and how the sector works when, when people do suggest that yes. one size fits all. We, we fly for fun, we fly privately. Um, we've got around about 10,000 members now, and, and one of the, the big reasons for RAOs to exist is because one size doesn't fit all, um, it's an opportunity for those 10,000 pilots to come together, form a body that can put a collective representation forward to CASA uh, and fight on those common grounds. Um, and, and along the way, we can support the other aviation sectors, but represent our members' interests 
first. And I think that's the, the key reason that RAOs exist is we're not CASA. Um, we, we give people an option and a choice as to where they want to fly and how they want to fly. Okay, thank you, Michael. So your, your uh, philosophical position is, to summarise, one of choice. Um, Andrew, for your benefit, I'll just rehash the question. Um, it's a philosophical question that focuses on the concept that one size fits all in aviation in Australia. Um, and Thanks, some, uh, some would uh, argue that there should be a uniform set of rules. And put simply, uh, if there is a uniform set of rules, there's no need for RAOs. So the question is, why does RAOs exist? Well, uh, without being too political about it, um, one might suggest there's already a numerous different sets of rules. So, you know, you can operate in the charter category or you can be uh, air work or you can be private in, in the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, you know, dominated regime. Why would RAOs, who pretty much exclusively operates in the private and air work category, not be a fantastic alternative uh, to allow people who are not necessarily involved in, you know, airline transport operations, which is what CASA's primary focus is under their own risk management and, uh, and safety determination, which is that that's where the most amount of passengers are, so therefore that's what we're going to focus our regulatory effort on. Perhaps it's a wonderful option for all of us that want to fly both privately and for air work to uh, have RAOs as a viable, uh, relatively cost-effective and far easier to deal with because of the size and volume of our operations than, um, than have us all regulated by CASA. I understand that we still have to comply with CASA's regulations and it's really important that we do because at the end of the day, we're sharing a lot of the airspace and a lot of the procedures and CASA does a lot of the heavy lifting for us in terms of coming up with the airspace design, although I know that's their services, but coming up with the license and the regulatory structure under which we can operate. But what we can do as RAOs is provide an opportunity that allows people to focus in a regulatory environment that only exists for air work and, uh, and, and, and uh, private operations, which makes our focus far more uh, precise than that of CASA, which is really focused on that charter and, um, and uh, RPT sort of end. So I guess that's, that's where I think. Okay, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, that flows nicely into the uh, into the next question, which is about uh, informed participation. Now, RAOs operates on the basis of informed participation. Um, that is that members and aircraft owners are the ones who are responsible for uh, doing the right thing, and the, the role that RAOs uh, plays is then perhaps uh, relegated to one of an administration and support and supporting role of um, the recreational movement. So the question is, candidates, if elected, how will you embody the notion of informed participation? And Andrew, I'm conscious of the, your, your time limitations, we'll kick off with you. No worries. Well, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think that informed participation does not mean a license to do whatever you want. Uh, informed, partition, uh, informed participation is a opportunity to apply an intelligent regulation system uh, to a group of people who are aware of the risks of the activity that they are undertaking. So, you know, if you look at parachuting, uh, it's all well and good to say that, you know, oh, parachuting, but they, they've got a federation and, and their informed consent. Well, they are, but they're also responsible as a body for the Australian Par Parachute Federation are responsible as a body for representing the interest of, uh, of parachutists, which I think applies to us equally here in RLs. Uh, but also the, the Federation does a range of things to advocate for the rights and for the interests of its membership. And I think that's a key thing that we can do uh, here in RLs is we can uh, leverage our knowledge and that of our enormous member base to uh, articulate to the regulators and to the, uh, the government bodies that are, you know, working within our sphere, a relatively unified position of a relatively large number of people so that we can achieve the things that we want to achieve uh, in a cost-effective and safe manner. And so informed participation allows us to operate at that private network uh, spectrum of general aviation 
at a risk level that may be slightly different to that of CASA in some areas without impinging on the general public's uh, safety for things like, you know, no one wants to get on a Qantas plane and have it not be maintained to the highest possible standard. But perhaps, you know, it's not to say our standards are lower, but our standards are different given that our members have accepted some of the risk rather than a person who gets onto a, a RPT flight who accepts none of the risk. So I think that's really what uh, what that means for us in terms of informed consent. Okay, thanks for that, Andrew. Michael, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, thanks, PJ. Um, I, I think, firstly, it's important to understand what, what is an informed participant. Um, and, and informed participation, it, it means that the person engaged in or connected somehow to the activity is aware of the risks uh, and and makes a conscious choice whether to accept those risks or not engage in the activity. Um, as, as pilots and aircraft maintainers, we are. We, we are intimately aware of those risks um, and, and we do make uh, a choice whether to engage in that activity or not. We're the ones who rock up and if the tyre is flat on the plane, we we get to make the choice whether to go flying, uh, whether to pump the tyre up, whether to refer it to a, uh, a LAMI or a, an L2 or a maintenance authority holder. Um, but we've also got to understand that those activities that we engage in um, may also expose other people to a risk. And, and these are the people, like Andrew's just mentioned, people on the ground, uh, people that live around the airport, people that live in the, the areas that we fly over and so on and so forth. And that person on the ground, they're, they're not connected to the operation. Um, they're, they're not making any choice whether we fly over um, or around them or, or anything like that. But they've also got a right to be safe. Um, just like I, I've got a right in my own home to be, you know, to feel safe um, from intruders, from a car crashing through the front door, etc. These people have a right to feel safe as we buzz around the skies. Um, and and I think in terms of how we, we incorporate that, that notion of informed participation into what we do, I think we've got to, as an organisation, as a, as a collective of aviators, we've got to uh, work out um, what is the acceptable level of risk? Um, how do we determine that? How do we manage that? Um, how do we educate people? You know, is it training? Is it meeting maintenance requirements, etc.? cetera? Um, <clears throat> but how do we overall, how do we ex assess that risk, the degree to which we're exposed to it and determine what, what level people should be uh, willing to accept? And that includes both our, our members and maintainers, uh, our pilots and maintainers, as well as the general public. Um, so what, what they're willing to accept and then manage those risks so they're, they're, um, we, we don't uh, exceed those levels. And as I said before, we, we can do that through training, we can do that through the syllabus, we can do it through maintenance uh, standards. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but it, it doesn't mean we get to say, hey, I'm the one taking the risk and therefore I'm going to do whatever I like. Um, it's understanding who is an informed participant, who isn't an informed participant, who's exposed to the risks and how we manage those risks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we'll keep going anti-clockwise. Simon, uh, would you like to uh, respond, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the key word in this question is informed. Um, I think both Andrew and Michael have touched on this uh, a fair bit. But to be informed, we really need to have good communication. Um, so we need to have good communication across the entire organisation, not just from, from management down, it's, you know, from membership up as well. Um, we need an ability to be able to talk about all the things that Andrew and Michael talked about, about risks, about issues, problems, um, you know, what's working, what isn't, in, in a positive way. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is we need to have a culture that supports that. Uh, people talk in safety about a just culture. You know, that's a culture where people can openly report um, when um, you know people didn't do the right thing, um, and we can then talk about it, discuss what led to the person mismanaging that situation or, or doing the wrong thing, um, without uh, necessarily punishing them or um, you know without um, removing their membership. Um, and, and a big part of that culture relies on the community, it relies on the membership. We do have you know, 10,000 odd members. We've got a lot of uh, smart and intelligent people. We've got a lot of experience out there and it's about harnessing that uh, membership, that community to really boost the culture and um, ensure that this idea of informed participation 
can really carry through the organisation and continue um, to be successful. Um, I think ultimately what we need to do is give members the tools and that starts with increased education. Let's be honest, no one in aviation intends to make a mistake. Um, generally it occurs because they didn't know differently. They didn't understand the risks and they didn't understand the consequences. Um, you know, with their level of experience, they thought what they were doing was probably okay. And for whatever reason it wasn't, but they just didn't understand it. So we need to educate people uh, which comes back to our point of communication. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that by putting the risk on the membership themselves, they tend to take greater ownership of it. Um, you know, I've got teenage kids and you know, I say to them, look, I'll let you do that, but as soon as you um, step out of line, I'm going to revoke that privilege um, if there's a good reason to do it. They take greater ownership of it when you give them that little bit of responsibility. Um, and when you educate them on you know, what are the potential consequences. Um, as both the other two candidates have already said, this is, it's not boundless. We, we have to have some you know, regulation and oversight put in place. Um, but what we need to do is, is to encourage the, the actual membership to guide what those boundaries are. And that's based on their level of education, their level of experience, um, how well our culture is. Um, performing and all those sorts of things. Um, and really that's the role of the board. The role of the board is to, to make sure there are mechanisms in place so that we can firstly inform the membership so we can educate them. So, um, you know, open communications and, and develop that culture. Um, we need to ensure that we're appropriately reviewing and approving any, any systems or, or mechanisms that are put in place. Um, but keep in mind, we don't really execute, as the board, as directors, we, we're not necessarily executing any of those systems. Um, and, and again, you know, um, it's, it's about spreading expertise, knowledge, um, you know, to, to ensure the growth of that this idea of informed participation. Okay, Simon, that's great. I like that concept of um, of uh, consequences. Every decision we make, every action we take as a pilot or a participant in the industry has consequences. We need to be. Uh, uh, educated and engaged with and responsible for those consequences. Uh, Danny, would you like to respond, please? Sure, thanks, PJ. Um, without reiterating what the other three candidates have just said, which is all very valid and pretty much conclusive um, to answer this question, um, the others also said it, but Michael made a point quite clearly about informed participation being about um, awareness of risk and the levels of risk and safety and from my background and my personal drive in aviation safety I find that really really important and lessons learned from accidents as Simon has just mentioned is paramount to aid in preventing reoccurrence so I think a really strong focus on lessons learned and the means in which this information is to get out to our members I think it's really important to have um, open communication with both sides, um, honest and, of course, respectful from both sides. And the way in which these can be carried out is through um, the directors getting out and about, meeting the people, having conversations and talking about the things that are affecting the members and um, providing our opinion, our thoughts on it, and really understanding where the members are coming from as well. Um, and there is other um, digital mechanisms such as uh, all the questions that come in can be captured in a way so they can be um, get a trend analysis to find out what is the most amount of information that our members are asking so we can put out publications, training, whatever the means might be. Okay, thanks, Danny. So the key there is um, engagement, communication and education. So all very good points. Um, the next question I'm not going to uh, paraphrase or modify in any way, uh, shape or form. I'm going to read it. Uh, exactly as the member has presented it, because I, I, I think it's uh, probably something that uh, a number of our members are thinking behind the scenes, but perhaps have uh, been remiss in coming forward to ask. It says, and I quote, Hi, I'm amazed how many candidates have ex-military aviation and commercial aviation backgrounds. I find it worrying that some may want to overcomplicate things RAOs was meant to be simple, affordable, safe aviation. I think we need people to keep it simple 
not make it more complicated. Um, the question is, how will you keep things simple? Um, so, Andrew, again, mindful of time, please, would you like to kick off with a response to that? Sure. Look, I think, um, first of all, why, uh, well, first of all, the process was open to anyone. So all of us, all 10,000 odd members of the association um, had the opportunity. And I guess it's just a reflection on the, the, the desire of people with our kinds of backgrounds um, to try and influence things. There's a reason why they call it service. Um, you know, it's, it's not service to country and everything else, although I guess in some respects it may well be. But it's also about, it's a, a culture of wanting to make things better. And uh, I think that you know, those of us that have put our hands up have seen that there is perhaps a, a way that we can help make it better, and so we've volunteered to do so. So I don't think being in the military uh, necessarily makes you a better or worse person than anyone else, but it does tend to make you the sort of person who volunteers and steps forward to take up leadership positions where you see that you can have an influence in a positive way. So uh, that's the first part of the question, I suppose, which was more of a statement um, by the member. Um, the second half is what specifically would you do? Well, look, uh, when I was running uh, the regiment um, as the operations officer, I took great pride and, uh, and I took a lot of uh, heat from my standards officer, who I believe is also a member of the association, so I may well be watching this, uh, in getting rid of regulation. There is nothing worse, in my opinion, than having regulations sitting around that are there for the sake of being there. Uh, now, some would say that regulations are written in blood, and generally they are. But also regulations do date. And so as a result of that, uh, you might remember that Kerry Packer, the front of the Senate, um, you know, quite some time ago in the 90s, and uh, said for every regulation you make, you should think we consider getting rid of one. Otherwise, all you do is just put regulations on regulations, which create loopholes and make it impossible both to comply and to manage. And I think that um, me personally, I, I like that philosophy. Uh, and so that is what I would intend to bring to this uh, sort of role is the capacity to see what the regulations are in their entirety and look for opportunities to simplify. Also, on a personal note for me as an individual, I chose general aviation and I chose RALs as did we all. I'd like to be paying our membership fees. And the reason I chose it is because it's simpler than dealing with CASA. I would like nothing more than to keep it that way. There was a reason why I left the military and part of that was over-regulation. I didn't join this organisation to create more. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, Danny, um, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, and I will stick with the nature of this question being keeping it simple. Um, I've never worn a uh, military uniform and I don't think the military style of practices and processes is appropriate um, for this, this um, organisation. And I fly a Texan. That's it, nothing further, nothing less. Um, and I absolutely love it and that's all I want to do. And I feel that that, it, well, I know that that is something I have in common with the members who choose to do this style of flying and only this style of flying. So I'm already um, like for like in that category. So I feel that I want to protect this for you guys and for myself because it is extremely important for me. It's got to stay fun. Okay, thanks, Danny. Michael, would you like to respond, please? Uh, yeah, thanks, PJ. Um, a, a bit like Danny, I'm a simple pilot. Um, I, I have spent time in the Army, but not as a pilot. I haven't worked as a commercial pilot. I fly for fun and only fun. I'll, I'll only ever fly for fun. Um, the the reason for me getting involved in RAOs was um, my ability to fly for fun was threatened uh, some years ago, it was around about 2011. And uh, I, my aircraft was grounded, and um, and couldn't be re-registered. So I got involved, and um, you know, my motivation was to protect uh, my right and, and members' rights to uh, enjoy private aviation. Um, when that happened, I, I found out that my predecessors, people on the board and, and within the the management team uh, that came before me, they'd made promises to CASA and, and they hadn't kept them. Um, they committed to making your one training mandatory. They'd made, um, you know, promises about L2 authority holders having to go through a ill process and so on. 
the finances were a mess. Aircraft registration couldn't be renewed, as I said before. Um, and personally, I've, I've worked with big organisations as part of my working life. Um, but I think my history with NRA Oz and my involvement in taking that, that organisation, which had a lot of issues, uh, that wasn't allowed to re-register planes, was losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and failing to meet you know, numerous obligations to CASA and turning that into one uh, into an organisation robust, financially sound and now registers aircraft in a matter of days. I think that speaks for itself. Um, prior to my involvement, uh, we faced numerous changes to CAOs, uh, regulations that were slowly eroding our rights. Um, and and since, and, and I, I want to emphasise, it's not just me, there's been a lot of people involved, there's other board members, um, we've got a big management team. But, but since coming on onto the board, um, we've had consolidation of some CEO, uh, CAOs. Um, they, they have been simplified, but there's been no material change to um, our right or our privileges in the CAOs, in the regulations, uh, et cetera. Um, we have brought in some maintenance training. Um, we have brought in some change requirements uh, around renewal of authorities, um, but that's meeting the obligations that, that our predecessors set for us. Um, they, they had made written commitments for CASA to do that, and all we did was, was execute it as a, an incoming board and, and management team. Um, the changes we're working on now in relation to weight increases, they'll be siloed. So anyone who chooses to exercise a right to fly a heavier aircraft, um, you know, they can take advantage of that. But the important thing is, if you don't want to take advantage of it, nothing changes. And that's the simplicity that we've got to work on. So we don't fight for new things and sacrifice old things along the way. Um, we've just got to keep it simple. That's what we've worked on for the last few years. And that's, that's what I intend on working uh, towards in the uh, in the future years. So we can grow without sacrifice if we do it right. Okay, thanks, Michael. Simon, would you like to respond, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, look, a lot of what Andrew said really resonates with me. Um, I did spend 21 years in the Air Force, but, look, I, I don't want that to define me or, or my approach to... Uh, my nomination for the board. Um, quite simply, I don't have any intention of complicating things. Um, what I'd like people to think is the experience that my background and my time in the military would bring to the to the role of, uh, of a director, as opposed to thinking that I'm going to come in with the intention of converting RAOs into a military-like organisation. Um, the, the military is a very, very different beast to, to recreational aviation. Um, you know, they have very advanced aircraft, complex missions, you know, they're operating internationally, carrying passengers, et cetera, et cetera. So inevitably it requires a much more complex um, safety management system and, uh, and procedures, et cetera. Um, and quite simply, they just wouldn't work in RAOs. Even if you tried to implement them, they just wouldn't work. It's, it, it, they're not designed for this type of organisation. Um, like like Andrew, um, I did uh, have a bit of a reputation for trying to uncomplicate uncomplicate defence uh, by removing a lot of uh, what I saw as red tape. In fact, um, I was uh, referred to in one of my reports as a disruptive innovator. Um, now, that wasn't meant in a polite term. Um, however, I took it um, actually quite to heart, I found it quite uh, a nice way of describing what I was trying to achieve, um, and that was to disrupt uh, and remove a lot of the unnecessary um, bureaucracy that, that was in that organisation. Um, so quite simply, I, I think, um, you know, there, there are lessons that, that I can carry over from my time in, in the military, but that doesn't equate necessarily to a change in policy or to making things more complicated. I'm, I'm a very firm believer that with uh, you know, proper education, with the right training, with support across the organisation, um, you know, a good culture in place, and we talked about informed participation before, with all of those things, we don't need overly complicated regulations. We, we don't. We just don't. It's, it's not required. Um, you know, it's become self-regulating to some some extent and people will naturally um, start to set their own bounds and that's that's far better than having mandated 
regulation and, and requirements. Um, you know, like some of the other candidates, I too came to RAOs um, as someone uh, basically put it to me. Uh, I think I came to RAOs to rekindle a passion that I lost somewhere over the Pacific Ocean at 30 odd thousand feet. Um, I, I came because I wanted to enjoy flying again. Um, and I just didn't want to have to deal with a lot of the regulation and bureaucracy that, that we see from, from CASA and, and in general aviation. So, yeah, look, you can be assured that if, if I am elected, that I will not be looking to complicate uh, anything that currently exists in, in RALs. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, the next question um, is to do with um, training and skills. And some would suggest that also uh, goes hand in glove with uh, being uh, cognizant of uh, governance and governance responsibilities. So um, can each of you please describe for me the training, if you have had some, um, or the experience that you will bring to the position which qualifies you as being a person fit for the role of a director of RAOs? So, um, Michael, we might kick off with you first. Um, if I may, PJ, um, I, I think one of the qualifications I've got is to try and give everyone a fair hearing, and I think we skipped over Danny. So, be, yeah, we, we might skip over Danny, but I'm, I'm, happy, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be first cab off the rank for the question when she's um, had an opportunity to speak. Sorry, Danny, did I miss you or not? Uh, no, I answered it. Sorry. Thank you anyway, Michael, for consideration. Much I, I, I could have sworn you didn't answer that. Okay, let's jump in. Um, perhaps one of my qualifications is not paying attention. Um, uh, that's all right, Michael. I'd like you to keep me, uh, keep me on the straight and narrow. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in my defence, my, my internet um, dropped out and everyone went a little bit sketchy for a little bit, so I'll use that as an excuse. Um, but back to the question. Um, so... Uh, in terms of the training I've re received and, and the experience I've, I've got, which qualifies me, um, you know, I've got formal qualifications in business and economics. Um, I've got a first class honours degree in economics. Uh, I've done a master's of business administration. Um, I'm a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, and I've done a whole bunch of um, postgraduate uh, qualifications as well. Um, <clears throat> I, I think... Um, one, one advantage I've got here, though, is I've got the experience of being on the RAOs board. Um, I have been on other boards, other advisory boards for government, um, as well as, uh, you know, aviation-related uh, panels, as well as um, some private company boards. Uh, I've provided advice to boards. But I think uh, the biggest thing that I'll bring is the experience that I've had to date with RAOs, the networks that I've, um, I've built. Um, We've, we've as I said before, we've turned the, the organisation around from, you know, burning uh, holes in the, the finances to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to, to some, uh, you know, an organisation that's making a modest surplus now. We haven't hit every target we've set. Um, we've, we've hit a lot of the hard ones, um, but there's, there's things that we're still working towards. Um, the weight increase, we, we've been tackling this one for two and a half years or something since we reignited the debate. Um, the debate actually started around about 2006 and there were people that came before us that, that tried and, and haven't yet succeeded and, uh, and we're, we're fighting that same struggle. Um, the good news is that's going to consultation uh, any week now, uh, according to CASA, it's imminent. Um, so I think in some ways um, my stubbornness is, is probably one of the better qualifications I've got. Um, you know, two and a half years fighting this battle. Uh, we've been fighting for part 149 to come through and, and get that over the table. Um, the organisation as a whole has been fighting a weight increase, like I say, since around about 2006. And um, and, and just having a, a, a bit of um, stubbornness and tenacity, I think is a good thing. Members don't want a director who's just going to say, it's all too hard, throw their hands in the air and walk away. Um, I'm not a quitter. Uh, I want to see us through on part 149, I want to see us through on the weight increase and I want to set us up for the next round of challenges that we're uh, going to deal with uh, over the next five or ten years. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew, would you like to respond, please? 
I'm having a Zoom moment. Sorry about that. Turns out if you use an inductive charger on an iPhone, it gets pretty hot, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, <laughs> I actually didn't hear the question. I'm sorry, PJ. Uh, so the, the question uh, related to um, training and background and uh, governance, uh, oh, particularly yes. training for directors. Sure. Uh, Look, uh, first of all, um, you know, all of us that are in partnerships with uh, members of the opposite sex or even of the same sex, if that's how it is for you, um, we like to take on the, uh, the knowledge of our, of our partners. And uh, I'm very fortunate to have both a lawyer and an AICD graduate in my household. Um, so I've got all the course notes that I can uh, bludge and read off without having to pay the expense of uh, doing the training. So that, that's a, a wonderful advantage that I have. Um, but also after, you know, 20 odd years, uh, of which about 15 were spent in command, leadership, management and operation positions, um, then I've been around the boy of, uh, of how to get stuff done. And then after leaving the military, I became a chief pilot of a commercial operator. And I did that by drafting my own uh, air operator certificate and all of the associated palaver with that, safety systems, safety management systems, uh, you know, operational management systems, business management systems. And so that's given me a fairly broad uh, outlook into how things can be done uh, at the uh, small business end of the spectrum. And also it's given me a range of connections that I wouldn't have previously had outside of the military. Uh, so that's something that I um, would really hope to bring to the role in terms of training and experience. Uh, and also as a result of flying instructing, both uh, as a CASA flying instructor in helicopters and aeroplanes, but also as an RALs flying instructor, I've learned a huge amount and met um, an amazing range of people, all of whom uh, I think that I could ask a question of and uh, be able to draw on their experience in order to improve uh, the service that I could deliver for RALs. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Simone, would you like to respond for us, please? Uh, sorry, uh, that's all right. You're not, you're not the first, you won't be the last, it's all good. Um, look, uh, I wrote a little bit about this, uh, as did most of the candidates, um, you know, what qualifies me as a director uh, in my election statement, and those really talk about my industry knowledge or, or my network, um, my understanding of, of the expectations of, of um not only the membership, but of um, yeah, the broader aviation community um, and things like financial literacy and legal skills and, and, and managing people and, and the like. I, I won't go into that in too much detail. Members can certainly read the election statement if they, they want to get a bit more of an understanding about me. Um, I think, moreover, uh, my ability to deal with pressure um, to, to influence people, you know, my communication skills um, and the ability to negotiate as well as my enthusiasm, I think are really my biggest attributes. Um, you know, I think that's really important for a director to, to have all of those sort of traits uh, and, and to know when and how to employ them. Um, outside, of, outside of that, um, I am a director of a company. Um, currently, I've previously been employed in several roles where I've held equivalents to, uh, to, to board positions. Um, I've also held a number of advisory positions, advisory roles. Um, again, not necessarily as a director, but certainly fulfilling um, very similar functions. Um, I was also, you know, 21 years in the military. Um, the majority of that uh, was in, in uh, executive and management positions. Um, I was, uh, you know, executive officer for, for an operational flying unit. Um, I managed over 200 people and all the processes when that unit deployed uh, to the Middle East. Um, I am currently a member of, but I'm studying with the AICD, I'm hoping to graduate soon. Uh, and separate to that, I hold uh, management and leadership requirements. Um, so really, that's that's a bit about me. I don't like talking too much about it. I'm trying to sell myself, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Simon. Danny. Thanks, BJ. Um, I currently work um, in as an executive in um, aviation safety, and a big part of my remit at the moment is um, 
uh, establishing framework and uh, strategies in how to obtain information from um, our members to find out what it is they need to learn. And I need to come, I currently come up with a whole lot of um, different initiatives in order to engage the members to um, help understand the jargon that is of um, aviation legislation. So it's about putting it into layman's terms. So I have a skill set there about putting a lot of things into layman's terms when it's needed and finding different mediums to um, get information out and also um, open up the opportunity for information to come in. Um, I have two master's degrees in aviation uh, related um, uh, degrees and um, I have extensive experience in aviation um, accident investigation. So with that kind of risk and safety background and it's really where my whole um, drive comes from. As I said earlier that um, in previous um, meetings like this, um, the looking after the pilot is really important to me when it comes to an accident and making sure that lessons are learnt is um, something that I have a great skill at. It is something I'm passionate about and I find it really important. Um, I too am a member. I think um, being a member and flying the way that our members do and only in that capacity um, makes it really important because I understand where the members are coming from and I can really relate in that sense. Um, and like Andrew, it's nice to hear um, being married to a lawyer in a positive sense, but um, I too have a resource up my sleeve. He probably won't like me saying that though. Uh -huh, very good. Thank you. Okay, um, we're getting close to the end of the session now, so I'm going to, uh, to start off with a question perhaps uh, a little out of left field um, to do with uh, our colleagues that enjoy the experimental uh, sector of the uh, the industry, and then I'll close with a question on uh, on um, financial um, on financial aspects and budget management. So, the question about uh, the experimental sector is um, about innovation by home builders. Um, even though they they may represent a minority of our membership, they are still members, and um, the experimental builders that build from scratch um, or build um, what are now known as uh, kit aircraft, it would seem that RAOs, uh, or it would seem to some of our members, that RAOs has lost its attraction and grassroots uh, that were based around the building of experimental aircraft. And we can all uh, re relate back to those days when it was rag and tube and uh, perhaps lawnmower engines. I'm not suggesting we go back to that, but some would still like to pursue that opportunity. So how do you in, how do you as directors or as a director intend to encourage further innovation by home builders in our sector of the industry? Um, and Danny, we might start off with you. Sure. Um, I think innovation is really important and our members are passionate people. So um, innovation is going to uh, continue regardless. I think the important point is um, RAOs is um, for the members. So if majority are going down the, as you say, kit building um, avenue, RAOs is going to go down that avenue in a sense of support and providing information. Um, and, yeah, so I think that is predominantly um, answering your question. So um, I'm all for it. And I think that, yeah, the members will speak loudly um, when it comes. Okay, thank you. Simon. Um, yeah, I'll go back to a previous comment I made and that was about innovation in aviation. And I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, I want to see innovation um, and, and this is part of of that, uh, you know, ex building experimental aircraft, I think, is, is really important. <laughs> Aviation wouldn't be where it is today if people weren't doing exactly this. Um, I think in the first instance, it's important to engage those that are currently doing this, that are currently building their own aircraft, that are, that are out there experimenting, and, and get ideas from them. I, I mean, I don't necessarily have the answers to this question. Um, you know, my initial thoughts are, you know, how can we look at some way of, of rewarding or, and or making a, a vocational um, sort of endeavour 
um, maybe through some sort of commitment to um, developing a, a design and building course um, where people can come together to, to do exactly that. Um, and we can, we, you know, RALs potentially could support a, a part of that or, or the entirety of it, maybe you know, fun things like a location for that to occur or, or tooling or, or all those sorts of things. Um, I think we should also try and link it in with the maintenance aspects of, of RALs, uh, use it as a tool um, to encourage and develop, um, teach um, you know, maintenance. Um, uh, we, we talk a lot in RALs about flying and the, and the pilot side of the house, and look, I, I understand everyone just wants to fly, but you know, there is still that, that other aspect that we need to, to take care of, and I think this is a, there's a potential opportunity here to, to tie the two together. Um, maybe we can have things like, you know, um, and we can talk about flyings and, and those sorts of things. Um, maybe we could have some sort of a showcase or a competition um, you know, around um, experimental aircraft building. Um, I mean, that's that's my initial thoughts. Um, as I said, I'd, I'd really like to engage the, the community that are actually out there doing this and, and see what ideas they have. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, would you like to respond, please? Sorry, I thought I tapped that. Um, I think firstly, we, we need to recognise some some worldwide trends in aviation. And um, and, and I look to our colleagues in the US, the, the EAA, and, um, you know, they, they are the world leaders in the experimental aircraft um, space. And and even they've seen some decline in this space um, over, you know, the, the past decade or even longer. Uh, and we, we need to recognise that it... It is a, a trend. It, it's not necessarily an aviation trend. I think it's just a, a societal trend that we we are becoming less hands-on. Uh, and so, you know, one of the side effects in aviation, of course, is that means that that we've got less hands-on people, um, you know, keen to build planes and and even maintain planes. And I think maintenance is is potentially um, a bigger issue in the sense that if we haven't got hands-on people to maintain planes for those who just have no interest, then you know, we we, we potentially face some problems there. So I think to um, to address it, I'd love to see um, you know RAOs tap into the knowledge of the SAAA members. There's there's a, a huge amount of knowledge out there um, with our our colleagues in the sport aviation sector uh, that could help us. And um, I follow them on Facebook. Um, I see them all the time running school programs and running yeah you know, some fantastic activities trying to encourage people into this space. And rather than treading on each other, I'd like to see us um, you know leverage that. I think we can learn from their skills and experience, um, but then on the flip side, they can learn uh, or they can benefit from our ability to, to fly aircraft under a simple set of rules. We were talking about why does RAOs exist? Um, it's to provide opportunities and choice to people like SAAA members. Um, people should be free to become a member of the SAAA, build their aircraft, uh, and then operate that aircraft um, under the benefits that people have fought for with RAOs for the, the past almost 40 years we've been around. Um, you know, we've got something to offer and we've got something to learn. And and it's not just the S Um I was talking to uh, Steve Pegler, who's just recently taken on the, the role of president at GFA, um, and we were talking about sharing experiences with spin training. Um, you know, our pilots can potentially learn a lot from uh, the glider training regime. Um, and the, the spin training that they do. Um, and of course, in return, we've gone through the part 149 process. We're nearing the end of that process uh, and we can share our experiences with them. And, and in fact, you know, I said to Steve, whatever we've got, take it. We're not gonna charge for it. We want you to succeed. Um, and if it's relevant to your organization, then um, take it and use it. Um, and there's no, no reason we can't do that uh, same sharing with um, aircraft building. So, but we do have to remember, we, we guided by the market. RAOs doesn't dictate to people what they do and don't do. Um, you, you can um, still build an aircraft under RAOs. Um, for some reason, people are choosing not to. I've, I've just started doing my level two training uh, with a local lamey. Um, and I, I think it's bitterly disappointing. Personally, I think it's disappointing that more people aren't involved in it, um, but, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and, and wave a big stick and, and tell people they must build their own aircraft. I think RAOS has to respond to market pressures, um, not drive the market, but respond to it. So we don't tell people what to do. We ask them what they want to do. 
uh, and then we respond as best we can. Okay, thank you. Andrew, your turn. Well, I think in, in the question there, you, one of the things you said was that we don't want to go back to stags. It's, uh, you know, rags and sticks and um, lawnmower engines. Well, I'm not so sure that's necessarily... I think, I think my, my reference step. was... I think my reference was to that's how the movement started. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that and also to recognise that we as an organisation are... Again, in, in the words of a former Prime Minister, we're a broad church and our role as the board and as the leadership of the organisation is to facilitate the desires of the members. And so if there's a group of the members that want to build aeroplanes, let me assure you, that's not me. I would not fly something that I have built and I would recommend you didn't either. Um, but there are some very, very highly qualified and experienced people out there who want to have a go at building aircraft and also there are some wonderful kits that are available, which realistically, someone with a fairly reasonable capacity with a spanner could probably put together. Why shouldn't we be sponsoring that and, and encouraging that to happen? Um, because at the end of the day, more people participating in aviation makes it better for all of us. Now, those people who are building aircraft, yeah, it's probably fairly unlikely they're going to be get, get the privileges to fly over the top of Sydney on a scenic. And, you know, depending on how we go with our discussions with CASA, there might be good reason for that. But there's absolutely no reason why a person shouldn't be able to, in their shed, on their property or around an airfield in a local environment, be able to build an aeroplane. And RALs should absolutely support and, where possible, assist in facilitating that process so that we can do what it is that our members ask of us, which is to be an association that represents everyone. Not everyone wants to fly around in the cloud and make life hard. Some people want to go out with the lawnmower engine on the back of the machine they built themselves, knowing that, hey, look, I'm just out here enjoying aviation. And for those people, a huge part of it isn't actually the flying. You know, there's, there's countless lamies and, uh, and maintainers out there who would be far rather fixing a machine than flying it. I think they're a very, very important part of our organisation and we should do our best to help them wherever we can. And then I guess the last thing is, in terms of uh, developing the society in general, which I think we have an opportunity to do here, those STEM programs that the SAAA runs are a fantastic way to solve a critical national skill shortage in it, licensed engineers in this country, which affects all of our aviation uh, requirements throughout the country. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Okay, so the final question before I ask each of you to, uh, to give us a closing statement uh, deals with uh, financial management. We can be entrepreneurial, we can be innovative, we can be creative and we can dream. But at the end of the day, the mighty dollar governs what we can and will and uh, when we can do things. So as a board member, uh, financial responsibility is one of the elements that you uh, are very much responsible for uh, in relation to RAOs and the direction we take. So to keep the question simple, how will you as a director work within the limited budget that RAOs has and ensure that uh, we manage our finances appropriately? So, um, uh, Michael, I might hand over to you first to kick off. Um, you, you said you were trying to keep it simple, so I'll, I'll keep it simple and say it the same way that I have for the duration of my time on the board so far. Um, yeah, and that is responsibly and prudently. When when I joined the board, um, I was entitled to a free ASIC and, and I said, no, I think that's ridiculous. Um, partners of board members were attending dinners and events at the, at the expense of, the, um, of RAOs. Uh, people were using the organisation to basically have a party on the company tab. Um, the first budget that, uh, that I was exposed to, the first approved budget by the board when I joined, um, projected a loss of $300,000, uh, a little bit over. Um, we turned that around by, you know, somewhere in the order of um, $450,000. We've now got a modest surplus of, of $150,000. So we've gone from negative three hundred dollars to plus one hundred fifty. dollars um, And all of this is publicly available. Um, you know, people harp on about transparency, but it, all of the annual reports, audited financials are all available for people to browse through. So, you know, if, you, if you've got questions, take a look. Um, the, the other thing is we've, We've made some pretty strategic uh, investments in, especially in technology, 
the members portal, the ability to self-service for member renewals, um, online payment processing and so on and so forth. And that's that's reduced our cost base down. Um, we've we've made sure that we still cater to that uh, section of members, that, that, that cohort of members that prefers to write a check or ring us up and pay over the phone. Um, that will not go away in the foreseeable future. Uh, it's it's very important to us. I mean, Andrew just said, if there's a small set of members that, that wants to build a plane, we should service them. And I agree, um, this is no different. There's a small set of members that prefer the old school way of doing things, writing a check or ringing up, um, then absolutely, we will continue to service them. Um, we've had to drop the magazine for a little while, but um, just recently we've brought it back and uh, and included it back as part of the member fees. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's how I would continue to um, to operate. I, I continue to manage uh, member fees in the most prudent and and responsible way um, that's gotten us to this point. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, Danny, would you like to uh, respond to the question? Yeah, sure. Um, I currently manage um, budgets, and unfortunately, they succumb to budget cuts quite often. Um, you're told that you have a certain amount and halfway through that financial year, they cut it. So um, I feel that I'm quite flexible in that way. And it's a matter of just um, prioritising, doing a needs analysis and identifying what is the most important? What are we going to get best bang for buck? What are we going to get best for safety and best for our people, etc.? There's a lot of categories. And I think being really smart about that and trimming off the fat is really important. And I think it's a matter of um, always being aware of where you're at and what you're doing. The set and forget and then coming and checking when it matters is too too far past the point where you should be looking at it. Um, so, yeah, and in the environment that I work in, we are um, accountable to taxpayers. This is the taxpayers' money, so we have to be honest. And I am the accountable person, so I will make sure that it is um, correct and okay, thank you. cost effective. Andrew, handing over. I think um, budgets are about two things. First of all, budgets are about strategy. So, you know, in this year, but also in the next couple of years, what strategic things are we trying to achieve as an organisation? So therefore, that then allows us to set priorities and then allocate spending needs against those priorities, which we can then come back and say, well, can we afford it or can we not? I mean, all of us run houses, we're all adults. And so I think we all fairly clearly understand what a budget process is. As a board member, I think our job is to assist in driving that strategy, which then allows the priorities to be set and then allows us to manage the budget. I mean, in micro scale, I run a scout group. You know, we operate on a ten, eleven thousand dollars a year. So, you know, much as there might be some talk about military people and, and public service people and spending money like nothing else, at the end of the day, the number of zeros after the after the first number are relevant. The money is the money, and the the, the managing a budget is about strategy and priorities. And I think that, you know, we've all had a fair amount of experience in that. And I think that as board members, that's what I, or as a board member, that's what I intend to bring to the board is strategy, priorities, and a sufficient level of management that allows us to continue the excellent work that's gone before us in the last few years to, uh, to manage the finances of the organisation to remain solvent, but also achieve the, the priorities that have been set by the board. Okay, thank you for that. And Simon, would you like to respond, please? My, my company currently works within a very tight, limited budget. Um, I think that what it's taught me is how to be nimble and, and somewhat thrifty. Um, and, and in turn, that has kick-started a number of clever and, and quite cunning ideas. Uh, and it, it sort of, so it becomes a bit of a circular self-sustaining process. Andrew said it a, number, a number of times. Um, I'll repeat it. I think the simple answer here, um, managing a limited budget is through strategic planning and through prioritisation. That's as simple as that. Um, as a board, we have an obligation to scrutinise the activities of RAOs and, and, and the financial records. Um, Nick's talked about some of the um, past 
perhaps some discretions you might call them um, and, and how those were tightened up. Um, you know, I'm sure with a bit of uh, clever and cunning thought, we can find other ways um, to be more efficient. Um, I think there's an opportunity to take advantage of some of the ideas and certainly some of the strategies of what I would deem to be COVID successful businesses. Um, I would like to see the use of more technology because I think there are significant cost savings in, uh, in using technology. Um, uh, but ultimately, you know, really what we need to do is ensure that we're investing as much as we can in the membership. We do have overheads, but ultimately they're the ones that are pseudo paying the bills and uh, and it's their money and we should be investing it wisely and in support of them. Okay, Simon, thank you very much. Uh, well, members, we're starting to come to the end of our session. I'm very conscious of the time. Um, uh, so what I would like to do now is ask each of our candidates um, to um, to make a closing statement and perhaps uh, take uh, 60 to 90 seconds to just uh, sum up um, your candidacy for the 2020 elections and then I'll just make a couple of closing comments. So uh, we'll go around the clock as I see it um, from, uh, from my desk. So Danny, would you like to uh, close off for us first, please? Sure. Um, to keep it quick and simple, I want to ensure good governance on the board of RAOs for the members. I can influence policy in government because I talk their language and I understand the way they think. I'm an advocate for pilots, um, as I've expressed many times. I'm interested in keeping costs down and making it accessible for everyone. Very important to me. Okay, Danny, thank you very much. Simon, handing over. Thanks. I won't take uh, 60 or even 90 seconds um, to, to sum up. Uh, I think that the questions tonight have really been uh, able to demonstrate um, what I would bring to um, RAOs if, if elected. Um, hopefully I've, I've made it clear that you know, my reasons for nominating are basically to give back to the organisation. Um, but also I, I do believe that I, I have uh, the right background to complement the board. Uh, but I'll bring the enthusiasm that's, uh, and the expertise that, that really required to capitalise on some of the, uh, the framework and, and um, work that has, done, has been done to date and certainly the, uh, the opportunity that I see we have. Um, like Danny, I want to keep things simple. I want to keep costs down um, and I want to ensure that recreational aviation remains just that, recreational, fun and for our membership. Um, I'd like to quickly take the opportunity just to thank all the other candidates um, and also to point out to the membership that regardless of, of who you uh, elect, I see that you're in very good hands. You know, the, the candidates really do have a lot of experience to bring and, and, and you know, I, am, um, I feel confident in uh, whoever is elected will, will gen genuinely um, has the interest of RA dollars at heart and will drive this organisation forward. So, um, you know, um, yeah, I think that's a very positive thing for the organisation. Um, thanks again to the candidates for their time tonight, to you, PJ, and to all those in the background. Thanks, and, and obviously thanks to our membership who have uh, taken the time to, to dive in tonight. Okay, thanks, Simon. Uh, Michael, would you like to respond, please? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think quite simply there's, there's things that we've started that we haven't yet finished uh, we're nearing the end of the journey for the weight increase um, and I've spent a decent amount of time on the board working towards these things. Um, you know, I want to support the management team. They're the, they're the guys who um, and girls who, uh, who who put the hard yards in on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, and I want to see those things through to the end. Um, we've now got a robust and stable organisation thanks to all of the work of those people I've just mentioned. The, the, you know, the management team is is absolutely critical in this and they've played a pivotal part over the next, uh, over the past six or seven years. And um, and I, I'd like to um, finish these things and then hand it over to the next set of stable hands to, to take on the next set of challenges once we've closed out the ones that we're dealing with now. Um, I don't believe in rusted on directors. Um, I think after this term, I'll probably run out of puff. Um, but if you if you like what I'm doing here on the board now and the, and the work that we've done, then um, I'm willing to, to do one more term and, um, and finish those things off. And and help whoever comes onto the board uh, over the next three years um, take it to the next level and, and build on what we've done uh, so far and um, and what's been done by people before us as well. Um, 
but I'd, I'd also like to say, um, basically echo Simon's words. Um, thanks to everyone who's dialed in. Um, you know, it's, it's been really good to have the opportunity to, um, to to speak to the audience and hopefully give some clarity on um, on the way that I think and uh, and what we want to do. And um, and I look forward to carrying out that. Um, and also thanks to PJ and the team behind the scenes for staying up at night and um, and helping us deliver these forums. Thanks, Michael. Um, Andrew, closing comments. Thank you. Yeah, and on with the other the other guys. It's been a fantastic opportunity, and I think no matter what happens, uh, the organisation is is going to get a director that um, has the needs and the wants of the organisation uh, dearest to their heart. Uh, I'd like to thank the people who put questions forward. You know, it's a really important part of the process is, is to be involved. And just by sending your email, your question, I think, you know, you've demonstrated as a, as a membership group that, uh, that you are involved. And I think that, you know, what you can expect from us is exactly that. You know, we want to be involved. That's why we put our names forward. And, um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to engage with some of those people that if I hadn't had a go at uh, coming onto the board, I would never have got to hear some of the stories and uh, and, and listen to some very experienced people. And uh, and perhaps, hopefully, if I get elected, then um, uh, perhaps share some of their insights and experience with the rest of the membership to grow the organisation. Um, so really, why am, I, why am I running for the board? It's to help grow the organisation and progress it so that it's available for everyone into the future at as low a cost and as high a safety as possible. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, members, uh, that brings us to the end of uh, tonight's session. So in closing, I'd like to remind you that uh, a ballot paper and a return envelope will be in the next edition of Sport Pilot. Please fill out the ballot paper, select your candidates and make sure you mail it back to RAOs by the 25th of, uh, of uh, September to ensure your votes counted. Um, I would like to thank each of the candidates uh, for their input and their candour uh, and the way with which they have uh, meaningfully engaged in the activities over the last three sessions. Uh, I'd also like to thank RAOs for the opportunity of being part of this, uh, this uh, live candidate chat. Um, it's been a challenge, but it's also been very rewarding. So thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone.